Well, that video was made by uh, Jen Gomel. Jen is a member of our staff team here at Chapel Street, and I appreciate so much her sharing a, a deeply personal part of her story, uh, that at a moment when she felt very afraid and very alone, she sensed and knew uh, by faith that God was with her. I want you to remember that line because that's where we're going to end up in a few minutes uh, later this morning. Well, we're two weeks into what we as the church call the Advent season. That is the coming into view of Christ, God coming into the world through the incarnation. But we're more than two weeks into the cultural tsunami that is the holiday season. The lights are popping up all over our neighborhoods. For example, how many of you have already put up your lights in your neighborhood? Okay. This is the famous Larson home in Elburn. How many have visited that home? Yeah, over a million lights at the Larson home in Elburn, but they don't have one of these. This is the famous <laughs> coffee basketball hoop. I probably have 500 lights in that baby. <laughs> Feel free to drive by, plenty of places to park, take pictures, selfies, whatever you want. <laughs> How about Christmas movies? Have you watched your favorite, favorite Christmas movie yet? It's a Wonderful Life, maybe, anybody? Favorite? Or how about my favorite, A Christmas Story? How about Elf? Or Home Alone? One, two, three, four, or five. I didn't know there's five of those movies. And of course, the car commercials are back. You know the commercials where they, somebody comes out and finds a brand new Lexus in the driveway on Christmas morning. How many of you are planning that for a loved one? <laughs> we, we won't share. I mean, really, who does that? Did you know that last year, Lexus reported sales in December of loan of 41,000 new vehicles? So somebody does it. In fact, did you know there's a company dedicated to making just those giant bows that they put on cars? It's called the Car Bow Store. It's in Pennsylvania. They sold 25,000 of those bows this past year. Speaking of cars, AAA uh, projects that between December 23rd and January 2nd this year, over 100 million Americans will travel over 250 miles from home. 100 million. Of those 100 million, 95% of them will drive. And of those 95 million who are driving, AAA estimates that some 980,000 will suffer a breakdown. A flat tire, dead car battery, something that requires roadside assistance. So you have that to look forward to over the next couple of weeks. The overwhelming majority of those who drive and travel will be visiting family. How many are planning to visit family during the holiday season? Okay. And we do that because this is the time of year we want to be with others that we love. I heard someone talking the other day. They said, the older you get, Christmas is less and less about what's under the tree and more and more about who you are with around the tree. This is the second week of our Advent series called With. Last week we looked at the promise of Emmanuel. It came to us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, where we read, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now today, all morning long, we've been talking about, and we're going to talk about it again now, the presence of Emmanuel. We're going to look at the story that comes to us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. And let me just summarize where we've been. Uh, Luke has already told us at the beginning of chapter 2 that Mary and Joseph have traveled from their home in Nazareth to this little town called Bethlehem to register for a census that was in preparation for a tax determined by Caesar Augustus, the emperor of Rome. Mary has already given birth to a son. They've named him Jesus, put him in a manger, which is an animal feeding trough, because there was no room for them in the end. We pick up the story, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I'm going to pause there just for a second. I want you to notice those words, great fear. Sometimes I think we've become so kind of familiar with this story that we don't really hear it anymore. We don't really hear the, the shock and scandal of the story. It's become a Christmas card to us. And we need to hear it as it is. The story is about essentially an unwed teenage mother and a fiancé that's trying desperately to find a way to divorce her 
to get out of the shame of the whole situation. Um, the Roman emperor has issued a new tax, which is always fun. That's why they're traveling. And God himself is entering human existence in the form of a baby. And there are a scraggly bunch of shepherds out in the fields terrified because the angels have brought the glory of God all around them. So the whole story is weird and unsettling, and we need to hear it as it's given to us. Verse 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. It's a familiar story, but we're going to look at three things in this part of the story, three things about the presence of Emmanuel. First, the presence of Emmanuel relieves our fear relieves our fear. Uh, years ago, uh, when one of our boys was quite young, about four years old or so, he didn't like to go in unoccupied parts of our house. If nobody was there, especially if it was dark, he didn't like to go upstairs or downstairs if no one was there and it was dark. So let's say he had to go to the basement to get a toy or his shoes or something. He would walk over to the basement stairs and he would stand there staring down the stairs into the abyss. But he wouldn't go down. He would just stand there. And he would look over and say, it's dark, Daddy. And I would say something really helpful like, well, just turn on the light. You've been down there a million times. And he would still stand there. And he would say, I'm scary, Daddy. I'm scary. You come with me? So I'd get up from whatever I was doing that was very important, like watching a Bulls game. And I'd walk over, hold his hand, and we'd walk down the stairs. Now, a few months later, a few, or, or it didn't take long, but I'd come down, come over to him. We'd only have to walk about halfway down the stairs, and he could do the rest by himself. And then I'd just come over and stand with him at the top of the stairs, and he could do the rest by himself. And then at one point, it got to where he could just look over, and as long as I was looking at him, he could go down the stairs. See, my presence somehow was enough for him to overcome his fears. There are many things that bring fear to our hearts. Isn't that true? Fear of death, fear of disease, Fear of disasters, fear of distracted drivers. We're driving yesterday, I looked across, uh, uh, over, and there was a car next to me, passing me. There was a lady driving the car. I'm not saying, I'm just saying, there was a lady driving her car. <laughs> and she was holding her phone up against the steering wheel with her hands at the same time as she was driving. It's kind of terrifying. We have all kinds of fears. Fear, sometimes even family, people who are supposed to love us, as we saw in the video. Luke tells us, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The Greek phrase is literally, they feared with great fear. The word for great in Greek is megan, so it says in a sense they had mega fear. This is the kind of fear that you feel when the doctor's office calls you and says, you know, something showed up in your blood work, will you come back in again? It's the kind of fear you feel, feel if you're a parent of a college student and your phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's the kind of fear that causes your heart to pound, your mouth goes dry, and you're paralyzed. Mega fear, great fear. Now, why are the shepherds so afraid? Luke says, because the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, we're used to those words, but we don't really think about it. The word glory in Greek is the word doxa, from which we get our word doxology, which means the praise or worship of God. And we worship God because of his glory. And it corresponds with a great Old Testament word in Hebrew, kabod, which means weightiness, heaviness. So the glory of God is the heaviness, the weightiness of his presence. And throughout the Old Testament, the glory of God is presented as both comforting and terrifying. 
For example, in the book of Exodus, as the people of Israel are wandering in the desert, they've left Egypt, they're on their way to the promised land, they're wandering in the desert, God caused his presence to dwell with them in what they called the tabernacle. His presence took the form of a pillar of smoke during the day to lead them and a pillar of fire by night, reminding them that I am with you, I am leading you. In Exodus 33, Moses begs God for his presence, begs God to show him his glory. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, but you may not see my face, because no one may see me and live. And he hides Moses in the rock and covers him with his hand and passes by, and Moses is only allowed to see the trailing edge of God's glory, his back, as it were. God's glory was a sign of God's presence, but when God, with God's glory, there came holiness. And holiness was often terrifying. A couple of ancient uh, obscure stories. In Leviticus chapter 10, two sons of Aaron, who was the high priest, are named Nadab and Abihu, were told that they offer strange fire to the Lord. That is, they offer unauthorized worship or frivolous worship before the Lord. And we're told that fire burns out from the presence of the Lord and consumes them. It's kind of frightening. First Chronicles 13, a guy named Uzzah the Kohathite, remember him? was one of the priests assigned the task of carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, represented the very presence and glory of God himself. And Uzzah and the others had specific instructions. They were never to touch the Ark. They carried it on poles. But the oxen stumble. It's unstable. Uzzah reaches out, touches the Ark, struck dead on the spot. Terrifying. God's glory, the holiness, the weight of his presence— was a scary thing. But here, notice, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Here's something different. Here, the presence of God, the glory of God, does not bring judgment or fear, but good news of great joy. What the story is telling us is that the birth of this child relieves fear. Because the birth of this child means the holy and eternal God has come to us not to judge or to consume, but to be with. Later in his life and ministry, Jesus himself would say in John chapter 14, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Of course, that's the Holy Spirit promised by Jesus himself. And we experience the presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit by faith who dwells in our hearts. And the presence of the Spirit brings comfort to our fears. We see this promised in the great words of the ancient Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The presence of Emmanuel relieves fear. Secondly, we're going to see the presence of Emmanuel renews our joy. Renews our joy. Here's a question for you. Maybe it's a dangerous question. But how many of you have at least started, at least started your Christmas shopping? Ah, pretty much everybody. Anyone finished yet? Be brave. You've finished? High achievers. High achievers out there. We all know there's an economic side to the Christmas season. Experts estimate that the average American consumer will spend about $950 during the Christmas season on gifts, food, cards, and decorations. That means as a nation, somewhere around $500 billion, and about half of us will shop in the traditional way in stores and malls, and about half of us will shop almost entirely online. Let's take a little poll. How many of you are going to do at least some of your shopping online? Amazon is going to rule the world. That, that <laughs> is happening, right? Now, the whole gift-giving process is um, stressful, isn't it? I mean, it's fun, but it's kind of stressful. I mean, how do you come up with a gift-giving strategy when it comes to your loved ones? Do you 
try to find what they want and give them what they want, like a new set of golf clubs? <laughs> or do you give them what they need, like a nose hair trimmer? You know, what do you, what do, you do? <laughs> if you're a parent, how do you choose from all the things you could choose for your kids? I was curious this week. We no longer have young children at home, but I was curious. So I just Google searched best gifts, best gifts for kids. This is what came up. I found all these sites. One site said 163 hot toys for 2017, 125 best kids outdoor toys, 156 best toys and gifts for girls, 100 brilliant toys for your little Einstein, 20 best kid-friendly drones. How do you possibly decide? Why do we go through it all? Why do we search and search and buy and buy? Well, we do it to bring joy, right? Coles quite possibly the greatest store of all time, but Kohl's holiday slogan is give joy, get joy. That's why we do it. Luke tells us, and the angel said to them, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now to, be, to even begin to grasp the, the impact of this story, we have to understand something about the key players. Uh, so I brought some props today. I brought representative uh, characters from our, we, we sort of have several collections of, of nativity scenes from different parts of the world. Um, and when you think about the characters in the story, they, they're kind of all there for a reason. There's a purpose. For example, Mary and Joseph, obviously they have a purpose, right? Then you have, Mary's going to fall over here. Hang on a second. Then you have baby Jesus, obviously. He's got a purpose. You have the angels. This one's from South America, Bolivia. In fact, these first few are. Um, and the angels have a purpose. They bring the announcement, and then they have the heavenly choir, and they sing, glory to God in the highest. There's a reason for them to be there. Then there's the magi, the wise men. This one, this one is from Israel. Um, they're not in Luke's story. They're later in Matthew's story. They show up a little bit later. But they have a purpose. They bring gifts fit for a king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then there are the shepherds. This one's from Africa. You can't really see, but he's carrying a sheep on his back right there. And then there's the shepherds. And I started thinking, why, why the shepherds? Because when you think about it, they don't really bring anything to the story, but they get the announcement of the birth of the child. We tend to think of the shepherds as kind of these kind-hearted Men like our favorite uncle wearing a bathrobe and, and with crooked sticks and they're kind and sweet and gentle. But when, when we do that, we kind of miss the shock of the story. Shepherding was an ancient and rather honorable profession for centuries. But by the time we get to the first century, to this part of the story, shepherding had kind of changed. It was no longer seen in the same way. It had become kind of an unfortunate destination for men who were not affluent enough to own their own property. They were not educated. They kind of had nothing else to do. They were at the bottom end of the socioeconomic ladder. Shepherds. Think, you know, coal miners in West Virginia. Think migrant workers in California. Shepherds had come to be seen on top of all that as somewhat untrustworthy because they allowed their sheep to graze in other people's lands and so forth. And because they were with sheep all the time and had to handle animal waste and, and came into contact with blood or, or dead animals, they were unclean ceremonially and were not allowed to be in worship in the temple and rarely could because they were with the sheep all the time. So they would have been considered and would have in fact considered themselves to be far from God. So why shepherds? They don't bring anything to the party. They don't sing. They don't bring gifts. They're outsiders looking in, spiritually speaking. But that's the point. They bring nothing, and they receive everything. Emmanuel, God with us, comes to those who are far off those who have been excluded, those who feel like they're not good enough to be in the presence of a holy God. Their joy comes from the announcement, I bring you good news of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Unto you, the angel said. God has come to be with, to share his presence with, those who were on the outside looking in. 
God has come to those who are not holy enough, not religious enough, not clean enough, not good enough. The birth of Jesus means that the good news of salvation, if it's for even the shepherds, it's for you too. That's the good news. And salvation is joy. Jesus said, again, later in his ministry, in John 15, these things I have spoken to you that, listen, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The presence of Emmanuel renews our joy. And then the third thing we see today is the presence of Emmanuel restores our souls restores our souls. Verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Now I want to focus just for a moment on verse 14 because it's often kind of misused at this time of the year. We most often hear verse 14 like this, peace on earth, you can finish it, good will toward men. Peace on earth, good will toward men. We see it on Christmas cards, we see it on bumper stickers, we see it on TV shows, and if we're honest, it kind of sounds like what our culture means by the holiday spirit. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. You recognize who that's from? Buddy the Elf, right? And it comes from the King James version of verse 14. Luke 2, 14 in the King James says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And scholars today agree this is a rather poor translation of the original language. The text we read today in the English Standard Version is, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And my favorite translation is the New International Version that says, glory to God in the hi- in highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. His favor. What is God's favor? God's favor is his grace. The undeserved favor of the God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Favor. Okay, so you're a shepherd. You know your place in the world. You're on the outside looking in. You're not holy. You're not good enough. You can't even go into the temple to worship. You know where you belong. You know, religiously speaking, you're far from God. And now you hear that God's favor is on you, that he has come to you and for you. Here's what I want you to hear today. The message of Christmas is not, let's just be nice to each other for a few weeks. Let's try to just change this old broken world into a better place by making some better laws, by getting some better education, by being a little more tolerant. That's not the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is exactly the opposite. The message of Christmas is that the world is so broken, humanity is so lost, so unable to save itself, we are so unable to save ourselves that nothing less than the death of God himself can save us. That's the message of Christmas. You see, the birth of this child is about God coming to those who have nothing at all to offer, who have nothing at all to offer him. Those who are far off, those who are unworthy, those who are full of fear. And here's the point. We are the shepherds. You don't have sheep in your backyard, probably, but you're a shepherd. I'm a shepherd. Because we are the ones who are far off. We are the ones who are unworthy. We are the ones who have nothing whatsoever to offer him that he needs. We are filled with fear. And yet to us the announcement comes, fear not, I am with you. I bring you good news. My favor is on you. A Savior has come, and he's come to you. 
my parents came to visit us over Thanksgiving for just a couple of days. My mom's 87, my dad's 84. My father was born in 1933, uh, the youngest of six children, uh, born in post-depression America. I've told stories about him in the past. Uh, his father died when he was only five years old, and the family struggled to survive. There was no life insurance, no, uh, uh, no savings of any kind, so they were thrust into deep poverty in uh, middle America. He remembers very little about those sad years, very few memories, and I think it's because it was so sad and lonely and painful. But he does remember that the summer after his father died, his father died around Thanksgiving time, and that the following summer, his mother sent him to live with relatives on a farm in rural uh, Illinois. He did not know at the time, because he was only six years old, but he knows now that she probably sent him there so he would have food to eat all summer long because she couldn't feed all of her children, not, not for sure anyway. And so he was there to, so he could survive. But he also knew he was very alone. He had chores to do in the morning, and because he was by himself, didn't understand why, far from his family, he said he would, he would go out uh, at, at, to the road out in front of the farm after finishing all his chores and sit all afternoon hoping that his brother would drive by. He knew his brother Bill, who was 18 at the time, was driving a milk truck to make money. And so he thought, just maybe, maybe he surely has to drive by, and he will wave, and I'll wave, and I'll feel a little less lonely. Well, he didn't know at age six that his brother's truck route was way far away in a different county. So every day all summer long he sat out by the road and his big brother never came by. It's a sad, sad, lonely time. Fast forward when my dad was 15 years old, a couple of his high school buddies invited him to a Methodist revival meeting. He'd never really been in church before in his life. He went and that night Jesus came to him. And that night, he not only received the gift of salvation, but a gift of a kind of joy, a deep inner joy that has never left him all the years since. And what he would tell you today, if he were here, is that from that moment on, he was never alone again. And that's the presence of Emmanuel. That's the God who is with us. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word today. And we ask you to help us to hear the great story. The story that we remember every year. Help us to hear it as if for the first time. Not just with our ears, but with our hearts. Help us to know that even though we, like the shepherds, may feel far off, may feel unworthy, that your good news of great joy is for us because you are the God who is with us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Just before the benediction, let me remind you as you leave the worship center this morning, feel free to stop by the kiosk out back, pick up your uh, ma ma Together at Christmas magazine or your Christmas ornament if you haven't yet already. There's a photo booth out there as well. And as you leave, we also collect our benevolent offering once a month on communion weekend. Uh, this is a fund we use to help those in need throughout the year from our family and from our, from our church family and from our local area. So thank you in advance for your generosity. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of Jesus, the God who is with us, and may his presence fill you with his own great joy. Amen. Have a great day.